Good morning, everyone, and welcome to James Way's webinar Wednesdays. I'm Victoria Frail. I'm the director of Hatchery Solutions here at James Way, and also your host of James Way's webinar Wednesdays. We are actually retaping this week's episode uh, because we had a bit of an issue. Henry Cole, our guest, lives in Indiana, and there have been snowstorms and power outages through there today. So if you were attending our webinar, that's the reason that his mic was fading in and out. As a result, we've re-recorded his portion as well as this short intro for you. I hope you enjoy, and if you have any questions, email, email us, us at webinars at jamesway.com. Thanks, and have a great day. Well, through this presentation, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts and ideas on ways to improve your management style, training of staff, and your maintenance program. Much like a three-legged stool, a hatchery needs effective management, a well-trained staff, and good preventative maintenance. When one or more of these elements are not functioning well, hatcheries tend to struggle in a variety of different areas, such as hatchability, turnover, poorly trained staff, poor maintenance, hatchery hygiene issues, safety issues, issues with biosecurity, animal welfare, to name a few. Well, let's get started. And the first leg on that stool is good hatchery management. And it is key to the success of a hatchery. Without it, hatcheries will have issues and will struggle. Poor management will also impact the other two legs as well. The reason we want good hatchery management is hatcheries tend to run smoother and more efficiently under good management. You'll have reduced turnover, reduced labor cost, improved hatchery performance, improved chick quality, reduced maintenance cost, and improved staff morale, just to name a few. Well, from what I found out in my 32 years of being in management, employees tend to join companies, but they leave managers or supervisors. In a recent Gallup poll of more than a million U.S. workers, they concluded that the number one reason people quit their jobs is because of a bad boss or supervisor. 75% of employees who voluntarily leave their jobs was because of a bad boss and not because of the company. So, for the most part, turnover is a manager issue. With a culture of blaming, punishment, inflexibility, and insensitivity, it only pushes your employees further away. Employees want managers who are leaders, managers who will inspire them, managers who are fair, honest, and will stand up for them and for the team. Too many times, employees become discouraged they stop caring and they just go through the motions until they find another job. So managers, I encourage you, please use a human to human approach when dealing with employees. It's people you are dealing with. Get to know your staff and meet them where they're at. Be as flexible as you can within your company guidelines. You can't buy loyalty, but you can certainly earn it. If you want loyal employees, please treat your employees well. So going and preparing for this presentation, I, I found a few, the next few slides here that I thought was very appropriate. Leaders who don't listen will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. And this is so true. I've seen this countless times. You've got managers out there that are either too busy to pay attention to their employees or they just they think they know it all and they won't listen to their employees. Eventually, their employees will not even go up to them and ask them anything, anything anymore. So leaders, I encourage you, please listen to your employees. Or as this says, you're gonna be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. 
your employees will be discouraged and they're end up they're going to end up leaving you another problem with communication is we do not listen to understand we listen to reply and if you think about this this is very true as well a lot of times when an employee comes up to you or a coworker, <clears throat> you're listening enough to formulate a response or to formulate a reply and not truly listening to understand what's really going on i encourage you all to listen to understand what's going on what the employee is truly telling you another big problem with communication <clears throat> is the illusion that it has taken place i'm sure you've all been there i've been there i've asked an employee to do something and when i check back with them that's not what i had asked them to do and i knew i had asked the employee to do that i get that from managers all the time well i told the employee to do something and that's not what they did well it's not necessarily the employee's fault somewhere along the line communication broke down either you weren't clear enough in your communication or they didn't listen clearly enough like we talked about in the past couple slides somewhere along the lines communication there was a communication breakdown so a good way to to hopefully avoid this is when you're when you're communicating with an with an employee co-worker it's it's always a good practice just to ask them to repeat what you had mentioned so um, i'd always ask my employees you know if i told them to go clean out hatchers i want to start with number three and then go to six you know i would ask them to repeat what we had just talked about and then if everything was right i know the communication took place if there's an issue then it wasn't it wasn't through communication communication also must be hot and that means honest open and two-way i'd like to add another t and make it h-o-t-t -T, and that other t is for timely so communication must be honest open two-way and timely it's important to if you have a positive or negative response well, it needs to happen immediately and in a timely fashion you don't want to wait to the end of the day or to the end of the week to talk with your employees be it positive or negative. good communication is essential for your staff to know what's going on and this should occur daily this feedback is essential for your staff and believe me your crew craves this feedback you need to have a positive attitude even when things are not going well so when things don't go well and all you folks in hatcheries you know there's days when when things are a mess it's important that the leadership has a positive attitude there's nothing worse than leaders with a negative attitude because things are not going well it's not necessarily the employee's fault and employees are looking for leadership and and leaders have or should have a positive attitude towards towards the employee you don't want to take you know a bad situation and take it out on an employee because again it may not be their fault skill in the art of communication is critical to the leader's success you can accomplish nothing unless you communicate effectively we've talked about communication here for the last few slides <clears throat> and the reason being is I feel it's it's critical and it's very important to effectively communicate with your staff so let's look at the difference between a boss and a leader and as we do so which are you are you more of a boss or are you more of a leader and then also have your employees you know what would your employees or who would your employees rather follow a boss or a leader bosses drive employees leaders coach them a boss depends on authority leaders on goodwill bosses inspire fear leaders generate enthusiasm 
Bosses say I, leaders say we. A boss places blame for the breakdown. Leaders fix the breakdown. Bosses know how things are done. Leaders show how things are done. A boss uses people. Leaders develop people. Bosses take credit. Leaders give credit. A boss commands. Leaders ask. Bosses say go. Leaders say let's go. So which are you? Are you more of a boss or are you more of a leader? And in, as far as your employees go, who would they rather follow? Or who would they rather have as their manager, a boss or a leader? So another thing we can do is, is take a look at <clears throat> the 20 most common traits of bad managers. This is from a, um, a recent survey in 2018 of over 5,100 people from 22 different industries. And these are, like I said, the 20 most common traits of bad managers. And if you have any of these, you might want to rethink, um, you know, and see what you can do to overcome these poor traits. So first off, we have a bad manager doesn't communicate clear expectations. Again, communication is number one here. Bosses, bad bosses or bad managers play favorites, never good for employee morale. They don't, con they don't show concern for the employee's personal development. This younger generation wants you to show con concern for their personal development. Bad managers, bad mouth people behind their backs. Never a good thing, again, for morale. If employees can't trust you, um, it, it's, it's hard to gain that trust back if, if you're bad-mouthing people behind their backs. They're not open or interested in feedback, so they don't want to listen to you. They, they want to prove themselves right. They're not self-aware. They betray the trust of others. Again, never good for employee morale. They don't listen to others. Here's that listening thing again. Again, listening is critical. They put their own needs first. They're a poor verbal communicator. They don't advocate for the employee or for the team, meaning they don't stand up for the employee or for the team. They don't set clear expectations for the employees. They don't recognize the employee's good work or efforts. They intimidate others. They can be impatient, abrasive, reactive, and they don't follow through on commitments, which is not a good thing as well. Um, it's important if you tell your employees that you're gonna do something that you, you follow through and you actually do that. And they can be easily threatened. A bad manager can take a good staff and destroy it, causing the best employees to flee and the remainder to lose all motivation. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit. We've talked about listening and communicating, managing folks some. Uh, let's talk about some other things that managers need to do, at, such as paying attention to the details and all of the basics or as I call it, Hatchery 101. All of these little things make a difference in how the Hatchery operates and performs. And over the years, I've found by paying attention to the details, you and your staff will begin to pay closer attention to the details as well. It's amazing how that works. When you're focused on something, and, and you're looking at it, your employees will be focused on it as well. So how do we pay attention to the details? So in order to do that, you need, in my opinion, you need to walk the hatchery throughout the day. Again, in my opinion, you cannot effectively manage a hatchery from in an office looking at a computer screen. 
I know hatchery managers are busy, but you need to find time to walk your hatchery, to interact with employees, and to see what's truly going on. Now, when walking the hatchery, you need to use your senses. Sense of hearing, sight, feel, smell. Not so much tasting my way through a hatchery, but I certainly use the other senses. And if you don't, and you're not walking the hatchery, and you're not using your senses, you're missing some small details. And as I would call early indicators of potential problems, such as hearing. When you're walking through a hatchery, you can hear if you've got some fan bearings going in an incubator or hatcher or on a rooftop unit. Can't do that from a computer screen. You can see if you've got water or coolant coming out from you know, the inside of a hatcher or incubator. Can't see that from a computer screen. Feel. You can feel the air, um, the temperature of the air, the humidity in the air, in your egg cooler, in your incubator halls, in your setter halls. Are they about what they're supposed to be? You can't do that from a computer screen. Smell. You can smell if you've got a bunch of rots. You can smell if you've got some electrical issues going on. Again, can't do that from a computer screen. So I encourage you, again, walk your hatchery and use your senses. Another thing that is critical to, a, to the success of a hatchery is a processing control. It is vital to the hatchery and this is typically accomplished through detailed SOPs. SOPs are standard operating procedures. If you don't have or use SOPs, we at James Way have, have you covered. We've got our operations manuals that have many written processes in them that you can use and develop your own SOPs from or your own standard operating procedures from. I encourage you to don't let things go. Don't cut corners with your SOPs or processes, even if it's just every once in a while. If you do, you're telling your staff that it's okay to cut corners. Don't fall into this trap because it creates confusion with your staff. And a lot of times with holidays coming up, we sometimes ask employees to cut some corners in our normal ops, standard operating procedures. Well, if you ask them to do it once, you're giving them the okay to do it all the time. And people inherently will find the easiest way to get things done. So again, I wouldn't do it. When you walk your hatchery, inspect what you expect, as I always say. Um, as you're walking, you want to make sure, again, you're using your senses and that you're checking, you know, see how, how the staff is following, if the staff's following the programs and SOPs that are laid out. Are they wearing their proper uh, PPEs, pr protective equipment? Are they cleaning properly? Are they sanitizing properly? Are they handling your eggs properly? Those are the types of things you should be checking and to see things to see and make sure things are going the way they're supposed to be going or the way you think they're supposed to be going. And I've got a word of advice here. When you're walking around and you see something that's not right or someone not doing something correctly, it needs to be addressed immediately. You need to take care of it right then and there. Because if you walk away, you've just told your staff that that behavior is acceptable. And just like a few slides ago, where communication needs to be hot, H-O-T-T, -T, <clears throat> this is where that timely comes in. It, the communication needs to be timely. Don't confuse your staff. 
you need to walk the talk. If you have a program or policy, you and your management team need to follow it as well. Maintenance needs to follow it. Upper management needs to follow it. Visitors need to follow it. If you have a program, it needs to be followed 24-7, 365 without exception. If you do make exceptions, you're just asking for employees to, to do that exception whenever. So again, I caution you, if you have a program, you stick with the program no matter what. The next leg on that three-legged stool is a well-trained staff. This is also essential to a properly functioning hatchery. And without good staff to get the work done, the hatchery is going to suffer. So we need, we need a well-trained staff. And with well-trained staff, you should see improved hatchery performance, reduced labor cost, improvements in the areas of safety, animal welfare, biosecurity, hygiene, um, maintenance, etc. The number one problem in most hatcheries nowadays is finding staff to do this type of work. We all know it's very difficult to find employees. So the ones you have, you want to retain. So what are some things we can do to help uh, retain employees and improve this? First is training. Second is effective in communication and listening, which we've already talked about and I'm not going to go through that again, and a, and a good proper onboarding program. So over the years, I found a simple three-step process to improve training. It is the tell me, show me, let me method. So let me explain a little bit, a little more about what, what this is. First, you take the new employee and you either talk to them in the office, break room, conference room, wherever. You have your SOP or your procedures or whatever you have, and you explain what they're going to do, what equipment they need, etc. Why this job is important, why it impacts the hatchery, why it impacts chick quality, you know, all the whys, why is it important? Then how are they supposed to do this job? You know, go through all the hows. When are they supposed to do this? And where they're supposed to do this? Once you get through all of that, you then take the employee into the hatchery and you show them, that's step number two, you show them how to, for example, clean a hatcher. You show them from the beginning to the end, how to clean a hatcher, the entire process. And then step number three is you let them show you how to clean that hatcher. So they'll go to the next hatcher that's dirty and you let them start from the beginning and, and clean that hatcher. If at any point in time they're not doing something right or they forget a step, Go back and go back to step one, step two, through the retraining process to make sure they truly understand what they need to do to clean a hatcher. If you do that and you take the time to do that, your staff will be very well trained. Well, then I have managers that say, why would I spend the time to train employees when they're just going to leave me anyway. Well, my comeback to them is, and I've seen this many years ago, my comeback to them is the only thing worse than training your employees and having them leave is not training them and having them stay. So I encourage you all, train your employees to as best you can. <clears throat> Onboarding. Onboarding is might be a new term for some of you folks. And onboarding is a process by which new employees acquire the necessary knowledge, 
skills, and behaviors to become effective members of the team. The process, process of integrating a new employee into the workplace can be done in a variety of different ways. The goal is to get the new employee or new hire immersed into the workplace and its culture as swiftly as possible. These socialization techniques lead to positive outcomes such as higher job satisfaction, better job performance, greater company commitment, and reduced workplace stress. I know most of you have a, a training program or an orientation program where they need to watch some videos and then they get you know buddied up with somebody for a few days to you know show them a little bit of what's going on in you know in the hatchery and then they're kind of left on their own. <clears throat> Well, an onboarding process is, is much more than that. Yes, they need the training videos, but it's, it's a lot of other little things such as, you know, new hires. They're always asking, you know, other employees or whoever, when do they get their first paycheck? They want to know, you know, when, when are they, when can they expect you know, their checks on a regular basis. You know, does your hatchery pay weekly, bi-weekly? How does that work? They want to know. <clears throat> Hopefully, through the hiring process, they know how much they're making per hour. But if they don't, they should know that. They should know where the break room is. They should know where um, the restrooms are. They should know, you know, if you have an, uh, an access code to get into the hatchery. They should know these things. They should know how to get into the hatchery, what entrance they should come in through. What is the process of, of employees getting into the hatchery? Do they have to shower in? Do they need to change clothes? What is the process? They need to know all of that. <clears throat> Next, and, and I, I know you guys have seen this before. For example, at break or lunchtime, you know, how long is break? How many breaks do they get in a, in a day? You know, how long is lunch? Can they leave? Can they leave during lunch, go into town and grab something to eat? Or do they only have 30 minutes and, and they're not going to be able to do that? The other thing is, is um, and I've seen this countless times, is where employees, you know, at break time, new employees at break time or lunch will go sit at a table that is, quote, um, you know, another group's table and they kind of get run off from that table. That's not really good for that new employee to get run off from a table. They're right away, they're thinking that these people are not very friendly to work with, those types of things. So, you know, part of an onboarding process is, you know, show them where they can sit, where they're not going to be run off. Um, another, another good thing is, is to have them buddy up with a trainer or mentor. You, you don't want to just, you just don't want anybody training your new employees. It's much like calibrating your incubators and hatchers. Not everybody can just calibrate incubators and hatchers. You've got a few people that know the importance of the calibration process and it's critical that it's done right. Well, the same with your, with, with your new employees. It's critical that they're trained properly and you just don't want anybody training your new employees. So you should have at least one or, or a couple, you know, trainee, trainers slash mentors that they can buddy up with for, you know, for the next several weeks to get them acclimated to that hatchery, the culture of that hatchery. And if you do so, you will reduce their workplace stress and most likely they're going to stay longer than if you didn't. New hires tend to decide within the first three months of starting a new job whether or not they're going to stay with an organization. And I, I think this is true, <clears throat> but I also think that within the first few weeks they decide. And if things are bad, you know, these new hires are not going to stick around for three months. They're going to stick around for three hours or three days or whatever. 
So you want to make sure it's difficult enough to hire employees. You want to make sure the ones you do hire, you know, you have a good chance of keeping and, and they're staying with you. Also with a good structured onboarding program, um, employees are 58% more likely to remain with their organization after three years. And that's not, that's not bad odds, folks. <clears throat> so how often do you, do you tell your employees they're doing a good job? Or thank you, or I appreciate you, or, um, you know, you did fabulous today. Um, how often do we say that to our employees? This younger generation wants to hear they're doing a good job. They want that warm and fuzzy feeling. And if they don't get this feedback, they tend to leave and they'll find someone or some company who will appreciate them. Remember, this group's been brought up hearing how awesome they are and how great they are, and they need this type of feedback. And again, I'm not saying to tell them they're doing a good job if they're not. If they're not doing a good job, let them know that. But typically, hatchery managers or managers in general the only time they talk to employees is when they have something negative to say or, you know, some um, criticism or neg something negative. Well, as a hatchery manager or supervisor, we should focus more on the positives than the negatives. So telling your employees thanks for their hard work today, thanks for um, you know, spending the extra time, you know, thank them for, you know, coming in on a snowy day or thank them for coming in when it's, you know, 10 below out. There should be more positive reinforcement than negative reinforcement. And typically in the workplace, there's more negative reinforcement um, in the workplace than you find positive. And I would challenge you all to, to change that and spend more time on the positive side of things than the negative side. I mean, it's important to, you know, have some constructive criticism for employees to improve, but, you know, if you want them to do a good job, why not reinforce them with, with the positive? And that would be my suggestion. And I thought this was appropriate. Good words are worth much, but cost little. So I encourage you all to spend time and in telling your employees they're doing good jobs. Even your worst employees got to be doing something right at some point. So, you know, good words are worth much and cost little. Third and final leg is maintenance. Typically in a hatchery, you'll find one of two types of maintenance programs. There is a reactive maintenance program and a preventative maintenance program. So let's look at each in more detail. A reactive maintenance program performs maintenance as a reaction to a breakdown or problem. They typically wait until the equipment stops working properly or stops working totally before maintenance begins. It lowers the life expectancy of the equipment, and by this time, the equipment is having a negative impact on the hatchery's performance and chick quality, etc. Versus a preventative maintenance program, which performs regularly scheduled maintenance to prevent equipment breakdown. It maintains the consistency of the machines and, and the equipment operation improves the life expectancy of the equipment and it optimizes the equipment operation and optimizes hatchery performance. So in my, in my opinion, preventative maintenance is so important and yet so many people just neglect it, which I don't understand. People will only react when things don't work. And once things are not working, now you really have a problem. This mentality in a hatchery can and will have devastating consequences. Many hatchery managers tell me 
they would like to have a preventative maintenance program, but they just don't have time. Well, and my response is if you don't find time, nothing will change. You will never get to a preventative maintenance program. You need to find time and you need to start. <clears throat> just like the Nike motto, just do it. I'm saying just do it. So how do we go from a reactive maintenance program to a preventative maintenance program? First thing you need to do is you and your maintenance staff need to be 100% committed to making this change. Second, <clears throat> what you do is you begin a preventative maintenance program on that one piece of equipment that is taking up most of your maintenance's time. And then once you get that piece of equipment under control and on a preventative maintenance program, then you pick that next piece of equipment that's taking up most of your maintenance's time and giving you the most problems. And you do that on and on until you have all of your equipment in your hatchery on a preventative maintenance program. <clears throat> the third step is use your owner's manuals, either the James Way owner's manuals for our incubators and hatchers or whatever other processing equipment you have, use the owner's manuals and most of them have a routine maintenance section in that manual. You can use that routine maintenance section to develop a preventative maintenance program. And then from that, you just wanna make sure that you're documenting what preventative maintenance has occurred and by whom and when it was done. Now this process I'm not telling you is gonna, is gonna happen overnight. This can take a while depending on the size of your hatchery, but once completed, I think you'll have a great preventative maintenance program. Good hatchery management improves efficiency and the of the machines and the equipment. The equipment tends and parts tend to last longer. You've got lower power usage. You have better chick quality. You'll have fewer unexpected breakdowns. You've got improved labor savings because you don't have processing staff standing around waiting on equipment to get fixed. And then you have more time available to work on other things for maintenance. So here's an example <clears throat> of some good maintenance on a rooftop unit where they're cleaning off the coils. Here's another hatchery where the coils need a little help. Uh, and I don't think a whole lot of air is getting through those at, at, at this point. So there, those are some good examples and I'm sure everyone's got a, you know, in their hatchery can find examples of good maintenance and, and poor maintenance. So what are some other things that make up a good maintenance program? We went through a good preventative maintenance program is a must. The next thing is follow the troubleshooting guidelines in your operation manuals. Most equipment manufacturers will have a troubleshooting guideline within their owner's manual. Following this will save you a ton of time and money by not changing out parts that don't need changed out. Five to 10 minutes to check out the troubleshooting guide will save you so much more, not only in time, but in money and money in spare parts. Maintenance should be focused on incubators and hatchers. The HVAC, which is your room conditioning, which is your air conditioning, heating, etc. The physical structure and components of the hatchery, your room controls, room conditions, uh, calibrations. Calibrations are, are critical. Uh, we talked about that earlier in the presentation. Um, if your calibrations are off, uh, doesn't matter how everything else is working, uh, things are not going to come out right. Um, chicks are going to come out early, chicks are going to come out late. So you want to make sure calibrations are done properly. And then how often are you calibrating the calibrators? 
the equipment that you're using to calibrate your incubators and hatchers needs to be calibrated as well, or at least checked. So that needs to happen. Now here's an example of a maintenance schedule from James Way um, Operations Manual. And this is for incubators and hatchers. <clears throat> and it'll tell you what needs to be checked after every transfer, what needs to be checked after every hatch, what should be checked every three months, six months, etc. And you can, as you can see, you can easily use this set up a schedule for each piece of equipment. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, going through the troubleshooting guides on your equipment in our, in the James Way operation manuals, we also have troubleshooting guide. I encourage you all and your maintenance staff to utilize these troubleshooting guidelines. It'll answer a lot of your questions and solve a lot of your problems. And when you do so, start at the top and work your way down through the, the flow of the troubleshooting guide. <clears throat> Don't start in the middle and, and, and start working it. Start from the very top and work your way through it. You're gonna answer some yes and no questions and believe you me, it will guide you to the solution of the issue. When I go to hatcheries to troubleshoot, I've got the James Way troubleshooting guide on my phone and I'm using that all the time to troubleshoot and, and try to solve issues. <clears throat> so in summary, I encourage you all to work to become a great leader. People tend to leave bosses, not jobs. Turnover is usually a manager issue. Appreciate and treat your employees well. Need to have good communication and listening skills. Should have a good onboarding process. Have a training and development program for your staff. A good preventative maintenance program is key in using your troubleshooting guidelines. Any questions? And thank you.